services, technology transfer, and custodian of the national units of measure to provide international traceability. DOST ITDI research and development covers five major areas food, environment and biotechnology, chemicals and energy. Material Science and Packaging Technology All aimed at supporting and answering the needs of local industries. Complementing its R&D are its technical services, standards and testing, national metrology, and technology transfer aimed at harnessing local industries' productivity and competitiveness and translation of developed knowledge or innovation into the production sector, paving the way for new businesses or startups. As well, DOST ITDI innovations serve as springboards for businesses to thrive and prosper. In support of the administration's thrust in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, DOST interventions are anchored on the theme, Aghama Teknolohiya, Sandigan ng Kalusugan, Kabuhayan, Kaayusan, at Kinabukasan. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, and when most of the country was in enhanced community quarantine, DOST ITDI bravely rose to the call of duty, distributed ready-to-eat foods such as the Pack of Hope and Mung Bean Cocoa Milk Drink to our frontliners in Metro Manila and other regions in the country, produced face shields via 3D printing and donated these to hospital frontliners, developing prototypes and 3D printing critically important parts of hospital equipment and improved design of N95 masks to better protect the frontliners. The Institute is also providing interventions for our displaced countrymen who lost their jobs and livelihood by making training available online whenever necessary. And even before this pandemic, DOSD ITDI innovations were critical in rehabilitating communities that experience calamities and even war and make them whole again. DOSD ITDI has been preparing for an innovative ecosystem for new knowledge and technology to thrive and help make us ready for Industry 4.0. DOSD ITDI aims to achieve kaayusan and to certain the future or kinabukasan through its initiatives and help businesses in every Filipino adapt to COVID-19 under the new normal. State-of-the-art facilities are being established. Construction of the Simulation Packaging Testing Laboratory, SPTL, and Green Packaging Laboratory, GPL, is ongoing. At the SPTL, stress conditions that affect products during transport are simulated that can help mitigate losses during distribution. While produced, products can be processed and packed in a green packaging laboratory. AMSIN or the Advanced Manufacturing Center, DOST's 3D Printing Technology Center, is a joint project with Metals Industry Research and Development Center, MIRDC. ITDI focuses on developing multiple 3D printing materials from local materials to reduce costs. Halal Food Research and Development Facility With this facility in place, the Institute hopes to develop new food products that are compliant to halal standards and as well support DOST as it responds to Republic Act No. 10817 or the Philippine Halal Export Development and Promotion Act. Enhancement of the competence and capabilities of the National Metrology Laboratory of the Philippines Expertise and facilities are being upgraded and construction of laboratory facilities for metrology and chemistry and biology are now ongoing. It is envisioned that the animal will provide the country with credible measurements and traceability in the fields of physical, chemical, and biological metrology. And with the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, DOSD response has been decisive. With the support of President Duterte and the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases, the DOSD will establish the Virology Science and Technology Institute of the Philippines, or VIP, to be constructed at the new Clark Economic Zone in Capas, Tarlac. The VIP shall be pursuing priority virology research and developing diagnostic kits, therapeutics, and vaccines for diseases caused by viruses, where DOSD ITDI will have a critical function. From laying the groundwork for science and technology in the country, the Industrial Technology Development Institute of the Department of Science and Technology, through the years, which turned 119 last July, has been consistently providing innovations to industry to help make them competitive 
emerging as a credible industry partner. The Institute has been instrumental as well in mitigating hazards and improving the lives of disaster victims and communities to rise again. With so much optimism with this cooperation and bridging of talents and expertise, we look forward to enhance science, technology, innovation, competitiveness, and the emergence of new research and development capabilities that hopefully will translate into new products and services that meet the current future needs of our nation and the people. Welcome everybody. Before we introduce our speaker for today, let me share a very quick recap of Dr. Lason's webinar last week. She introduced us to viruses or, the, or, or obligate intracellular parasites whose genetic material can either be RNA or DNA and those in a protein pool or sometimes membranes. Viruses are very ubi ubiquitous, meaning they can be found everywhere. So, a lot of virologists classify them through the Baltimore classification scheme for their group based on their genetic material. While not all of the viruses cause diseases, some of them does, and most of that do, are zoonotic, meaning they can spread from animals to humans. And since, I quote Dr. Dayson, the health of the people are very much connected to the health of the animals and the shared environment. She introduced us to the One Health concept, which tackles shared health threats by, lo by looking at all angles, humans, animals, plants, and environment. Dr. Leeson also noted a relevant fact for today's webinar. It is that the discovery of DNA as the genetic material came from a study of viruses, specifically bacteriophages, or viruses that infect bacteria, which will be the main character for today's webinar. Now, let me formally introduce our distinguished medic scientist and user speaker for today. After taking his bachelor's degree in biology from, un from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Dr. Elpidio Cesar Binadala Jr. obtained several graduate studies from different universities, including University of Hawaii, National University of Singapore, and the University of Cambridge. He has a master's degree in microbiology and doctorate degree in microbiology and animal virology. He also is a holder of two postdoctorate specializations in both aquatic virology and medical biotechnology. In 2003, Dr. Nadala Jr. co-founded Diagnostics for the Real World, where he led the development of rapid diagnostic tests for various human pathogenic viruses. From 2008 to early 2018, he worked in the food and environmental testing industry, where he, along with other scientists and technicians, developed and produced cutting-edge diagnostic kits for the detection of different adulterants from food and water. In late 2018, he returned to the Diagnostics for the Real World as the Vice President of Research and Development during the recent pandemic in February 2020, his team started the development of the SAMBA-2 SARS-CoV-2 test for the detection of SARS-CoV-2 RNA. This test is now being used in 79 hospitals and schools in the United Kingdom. Dr. Nad Dr. Nadala Jr.'s aim is to utilize the knowledge and experience he has acquired throughout his career in helping Filipino scientists and engineers in the field of virology and diagnostics. Now, now, I encourage everyone to join me in welcoming our speaker for today, Dr. Nadala Jr. Yeah, hello. Uh, let me share my screen.
Okay, let's see. Hold on. Oh, I think I have the wrong one. Okay, got it. Do you see my screen? Yes, bro. Good. Uh, good morning, everyone. Gandang uh, maga po. Thank you for that introduction. I hope uh, you're not disappointed that I'm not Dr. Layson. I think there was some confusion about uh, the presenter for this particular topic. But um, so my presentation is going to be divided into two parts. Uh, part one is uh, phage isolation and culture. And part two is phage characterization. So we begin with a little background on bacteriophages, uh, first on their discovery. Um, the discovery of phages. Me, Dr. Nadala? Yes? Sorry, excuse me. You are currently in presenter's view. We, wait now. Um, um, please, click na lang daw po yung slideshow sa upper left po. Asensya na po. Yeah. Um. Is there a problem? Slideshow daw po. Yung, kasi po naka-presenters okay. dito. Okay. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, let me see. Okay. Sorry. Mm. Is that good? Yeah. Yes, Pop. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, Pop. Oh, that's fine. Thank you, Pop. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, for, first on the discovery. Um, the discovery of phages was first reported in 1915 and 1917 by Port and de uh, Frederick William Port was a British pathologist in London described, described in 1915 the glassy transformation of micrococcus colonies, which are bacteria colonies, by a transmissible agent. And he proposed several explanations one of which was that the agent was viral in nature. Uh, Port did not pursue this discovery, but attempted for decades to propagate vertebrate viruses in inert media. Felix uh, Hubert de Herel, a French Canadian then working at the Pasteur Institute of Paris, observed the lysis of Shigella cultures in broth and described, described it in 1917. And Dihirel clearly recognized the viral nature of his agent and devoted the rest of his scientific life to it. Uh, he coined the term bacteriophage, devised several techniques still in use, and postulated the uh, intracellular multiplication of viruses, and introduced phage therapy of infectious diseases. So that early, uh, there was already the concept of phage therapy. Uh, and this is because uh, he noticed the, the ability of bacteriophages to kill bacteria. And uh, that's where the name came from, phage, uh, from the Greek word uh, phagin, meaning to devour and eat. Uh, that's me there in Pasteur Institute when I visited a few years ago. Most phages consist of an outer protein uh, capsid, enclosing a nucleic acid genome. A few types have lipid-containing envelopes or contain lipids as part of the particle wall. But essentially, phages, like 
more than 90% are uh, protein capsid enclosing a nucleic acid genome, uh, usually double-stranded DNA. So most phages contain double-stranded DNA, but there are small phage groups with single-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, or double-stranded RNA. Genome sizes can be between 5 and 700 kilobase pairs, or 5,000 and 700,000 uh, pairs of nucleotides. So this is the uh, morphology of morphotypes of bacteriophages. If you look at the top left here, this is the majority of phages, uh, tailed, uh, tailed uh, icosahedral uh, shaped phages. And there are some that are, uh, of course, polyhedral, uh, filamentous, and pleomorphic, but these are all a small minority. So you will encounter mostly these types, the tailed phages. So uh, how, do, how are the phages uh, classified? Mor they're classified by morphology and the nature and size of the phage genome. These are used for uh, classification. Uh, the rapidly changing International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses or ICTV classification of bacteriophages had 14 orders, 49 families, and 975 genera by last count. Tailed phages are classified into the order Caudoviralis, which is, as I said, the, the most of the phages, 14 families, 927 genera, and 2,814 species. They constitute 96% of phage species that have been characterized so far. Uh, polyhedral filamentous pleomorphic phages, as I mentioned, comprise about 4%. And they're classified in small families. So how did bacteriophages come about? Bacteriophages occur in over 140 bacterial or archaeal genera. Their distribution reflects their origin and bacterial phylogeny. Bacteriophages arose repeatedly in different hosts. So we call that polyphyletic because they arose in uh, basically not from a single ancestor, but multiple ancestors arising from multiple hosts, bacterial hosts. So they constitute 11 lines of descent uh, so far. Uh, so 11 ancestors, original uh, bacteriophages ancestors. Failed phages appear as a monophyletic virus group, which means they on only one uh, original host. Tailed phages are the oldest viruses and originated before the separation of eobacteria and eu-archaeota, which is uh, the other group of bacteria, the archaeobacteria. So they may be as old as 3.5 billion years, close to the origin of life. So bacteriophages are the oldest. Now, uh, how abundant are bacteriophages in the environment? In the soil, you will find 10 million bacteriophages in one gram. So one gram of soil, you'll find 10 million plaque forming units. That, that means a unit of bacteriophage that can form a plaque in a lawn of bacteria. I'll show you a plaque, what plaque looks like later on. Uh, that's a lot. But in seawater, you also have one to 10 million uh, plaque forming units of uh, bacteriophage. And knowing how much seawater there is, then 
uh, raw domestic sewage, you have 100 million to 10 billion platforming units of bacteriophages. So you're looking for bacteriophages, you know where to look, raw domestic sewage. For almost every bacterial species, at least one phage exists that can specifically infect and destroy it. The numbers of known phages have been expanding for decades at a rate of approximately 100 per year. And novel phages are continuous, continually reported in investigations of the environment and industrial fermentations. So there is no end in sight to the discovery of novel phages. So we're talking about isolation and uh, characterization of phages. There's a lot of work that remains. Only a fraction of the bacterial phyla have, has been investigated for the presence of phages. There is an estimated 10 to the 31 phages in the biosphere, making them the most abundant biological entities on this planet. In phage ecology, as in many, many fields, we are still at the threshold of human knowledge. Viral metagenomics, which I'll describe later on, indicates that the environment, especially the sea, contains vast and cultured viral communities. Although marine phages are frequently detected by genomics and electron microscopy, their isolation is generally not attempted. Some phage habitats have been scarcely investigated, for example, the deep sea or industrial fermenters and mining effluents. Most phage descriptions come from a handful of developed countries. No phages have been reported from large geographic areas, such as tropical Africa and Siberia. So there's a lot remaining, a lot of work isolating and characterizing phages. Phages, phages are agents of ecosystem change because they prey on specific bacterial populations. They mediate lateral gene transfer. They alter host metabolism. They redistribute bacterially derived compounds through cell lysis. By lysing their cells, then the compounds are released and they to the environment. They spread antibiotic resistance. They disperse pathogenicity factors that cause disease in humans and animals. Some of the uh, pathogenic bacteria, for example, found in food, they carry phages that make them uh, highly pathogenic. So, but phages are not all that bad. They have some applications, for example, in phage therapy. Uh, phages are used against antibiotic resistant bacteria. They have been used. Of course, they're not a standard treatment at the moment, but people are working on this field. Uh, they are used to type uh, certain bacteria like Salmonella or E. coli. Interhemorrhagic yeah. E. coli are, are uh, typed using phages. Uh, they are used in microbial source tracking. Uh, QPCR. And uh, there are bacteriophage based biosensors. Uh, these oh. biosensors. Uh, are developed using advances in DNA sequencing and reporter systems such as use of luciferase uh, as a reporter system. Uh, if we have enough time, I can talk about that later. Biocontrol agents in food safety, for instance, phages against E. coli 0157 in the beef industry uh, were used as well as phages against 
Campylobacter in poultry. And uh, they have been used uh, as uh, phage display libraries, uh, for example, to generate single chain antibodies against various targets. So sample preparation for phage isolation. Uh, this example is uh, on solid samples. Uh, so if you have a solid sample and you want to isolate phages from there, solid sample like uh, feces, for example, animal feces. Uh, so what you would do initially is you, uh, of course, you note down the sample uh, type when you receive the consistency, you weigh out five grams and add 45 ml of buffer. Uh, so you store that with gentle shaking uh, and this will allow the phage to dissociate into the buffer. Then you centrifuge the buffer uh, to spin down the uh, solids. And then you take the supernatant, the liquid, and centrifuge that at high speed for at least five minutes then you are able to pellet the bacterial cells. Then you, you filter the supernatant, which still has uh, bacteriophage uh, to a 0.2 micron filter so that you remove all bacteria and small particles. And then that, that sample now is going to be put into whatever bacteria you want to use to look for bacteriophage that lies that bacteria. For example, I want to look for E. coli 157 phages so I can treat you know, my cattle or my, my beef uh, with that phage uh, to kill 157 bacteria. So that's for solid samples. Uh, for liquid or like sewage samples, we we mentioned earlier that sewage contains a lot of bacteriophages. Uh, for sewage samples, for example, I'm looking for phage that would lyse listeria. Uh, I would take 50 ml of sewage sample, spin that at uh, 2500 G for 10 minutes, and that removes the large debris. Then I'd filter the supernatant from there in a 0.22 micrometer membrane filter that removes most bacteria, bacterial contaminants. Uh, and then I would mix that sample with an equal volume of terrific broth. This is a nutritionally rich medium for growth of bacteria and divide that into 10 batches of, uh, into 10 batches. And then uh, to each batch, I would add 500 microliters of an exponentially growing bacterial culture uh, of one indicator strain, for example, listeria. Uh, and then after five or six hours incubation in the water bath, then uh, I would centrifuge that mixture and filter it again because I introduced the bacteria, remember? So I have to remove that and separate it from the bacteriophage. So now I have a sample that's ready to assay for bacteriophage by plaque assay. So how is uh, that isolation? Um, okay, so now I have the sample that I've gotten either from solid sample or from the liquid as I just described. Uh, that was sample preparation. Now is actual isolation. So if I'm isolating phages against E. coli 0157 and Salmonella, for example, I would grow uh, the uh, Salmonella or E. coli 0157 in uh, triptych soy broth for about two hours at 37 degrees, which is what they like. Once I have the uh, the, um, the bacteria, I can either do a direct spotting method by making lawn plates uh, uh, with this bacteria, 
or I can enrich uh, my sample, the one that I did sample prep on, uh, in 900 microliters of that culture. Uh, so normally, uh, people if if they if they use a sewage where they expect a lot of bacteriophage, they would they can do direct spotting. They you don't even have to enrich. But in case you need to enrich, you have to do a, a water bath overnight at 37, and then you add chloroform, and then you centrifuge. Oh, sorry. You centrifuge at higher speed to pellet the uh, the bacteria, and then use the supernatant uh, to spot the lawn. So you can either either do direct spotting or you can enrich first this way and spot that. So you spot 10 microliters of at least two uh, two spots per sample onto the lawn, incubate overnight. If you have no plaques, then you go back, uh, but it's unlikely. Uh, but if you have positive uh, plaque, uh, that, then you pluck the plaque and place it in buffer and then proceed to plaque purification, which I'll describe later. Okay. So uh, here's an example of E. coli 0157 uh, phage isolates. So these are all lawns of E. coli 0157. And these are the spots of uh, various uh, samples. Okay. And uh, in this case, they all produce uh, plaques. So these are what we call plaques, cleared areas in the bacterial lawn. Now, isolation of listeria phages uh, goes similar to E. coli 157 and Salmonella. But in this case, uh, you would grow the, uh, the bacteria in a special medium, different from when you grow Salmonella and E. coli, because Listeria likes a different medium. It likes EHI or brain heart infusion, very rich and supplemented with calcium chloride, uh, again, it's the same thing. You either direct spot or you enrich. If you enrich or direct spot, either way, you use more sample. Listeria is not as abundant as uh, Salmonella or E. coli. So you make long plates and you add uh, 200 microliters of uh, grown culture, and then you spot uh, you spot the sample. Okay, uh, either direct spotted or the same. So it's the same process. Yeah, either negative or positive and you do the same thing, uh, but just a different medium and different amount of bacteria to put on the plate for your lawn. Uh, here's an example of a lawn of bacteria, but this time uh, the uh, the virus was just added along with the bacteria lawn. So it's not a distinct 10 microliter spot, but rather kind of a spread, spread out. And you can see that the different listeria plaques have different sizes. So uh, if you're looking for a really good lytic phage, you would take out the uh, bigger plaques. That means they're uh, they have higher uh, they have higher efficiency of plating, and uh, so this is from a sprout sample, uh, and these are listeria uh, phages because this is a listeria lawn from bean sprouts. Now, for isolating bacillus phages, uh, again, there's a change in the medium, of course. Uh, you can use uh, TSB, triptych soy broth, or, and uh, again, you use a bigger amount here uh, to uh, uh, culture, because again, if this is not Salmonella E. coli, so you need a little bit more bacteria, 
bacillus. Uh, but everything the same except for incubation. You notice it's 30 degrees and not 37 because bacillus likes this temperature. And again, it's negative or positive. And fortunately, I don't have a uh, sample. Uh, we weren't really working on bacillus. Uh, we were working on Salmonella 157 and then Listeria. Uh, this can also be done with uh, Campylobacter phages from poultry. Uh, notice that it's poultry excreta. So the sample preparation here is for solids, as I described earlier. Uh, there's a lot of changes for Campylobacter. Uh, uh, Number one, uh, although you can grow it in a brain heart infusion because brain heart infusion is very rich, it also it grows at higher temperature. Notice it's not 37, it's 42 degrees. And, uh, and uh, your enrichment is more of a four plate method than a, uh, than a uh, broth, enrichment broth. Uh, and if you wanna make a lawn in a plate, you, you use 500 microliters uh, and not 100 or 200 microliters. You use a lot more. In this weird looking medium called NZCYM, it just stands for the composition of the medium, which uh, consists of casein enzymatic hydrolysate, cas amino acid, yeast extract, and magnesium. Okay. Uh, notice that you don't have cas amino acid in this one here. So basically isolation of the different phages depends on the bacterial host that they attack. Uh, and um, so you just basically change the media and the incubation temperature and time based on what the ba bacteria likes. And then you add the phage and let it do its work. Of course, for Campylobacter, you want to have microaerobic. So you have to really deplete the oxygen uh, because it doesn't like uh, aerobic conditions. Again, that's for the bacteria. For the, the, for the phage to grow, the bacteria has to be actively growing. Otherwise, the phage is not gonna do anything because it's an obligate intracellular parasite. So it won't replicate. So how are phages? that uh, are against difficult to culture bacteria discovered. So you're looking for a phage against a bacteria, for example, uh, like uh, Bacteroides, uh, which is abundant in your uh, intestines, but hard to grow. Uh, so how can I find the phages that grow in this bacteria so that I can attack the bacteria? or get the phages to attack them. Well, uh, metagenomics, as I mentioned earlier, or sequencing of the genetic material from a complete microbial community. Uh, that means, okay, you have a community of, of uh, bacteria in human feces, for example, or uh, yeah. And uh, you want to know what phages are in there. Well, you can't culture them because you don't have a bacterial host. So what you do is you extract all of the genetic material from that fecal sample and then sequence them all and sort them out, which one is human and which ones are from bacteria in there or which ones could be from virus or, or bacteriophage. Uh, of course, if it's a new bacteriophage, it's going to be difficult. You have to do a lot of bioinformatics tricks to be able to distinguish that, oh, this must be a bacteriophage rather than uh, a, a virus against uh, you know, humans. Uh, so for example, as I just mentioned in a human fecal metagenomes, because Researchers do this a lot now. With next generation sequencing, you can just sequence all of the nucleic acids in, in your sample. They found a 97 kilobase pair genome, so 97,000 base pair 
within the uh, bacteriophage uh, scope. Of a previously unidentified bacteriophage, they call crass phage. Uh, is six times more abundant than all other known phages together in that particular sample. So it comprises up to 90% and 22% of all reads, uh, read meaning sequences that they found in this sample in a virus like particle derived metagenome, 90%, and for the total community, 22% of the metagenomes. So using a new co-occurrence profiling approach, that means they found bacteroides, they found this in the same abundance. They, they predict that this bacteriophage, uh, the host is a bacteroides bacteria. Okay, so bacteriophage purification. So if the plaques, it means clear confluent lysis, as you saw earlier, are seen in the initial plating. You extract a single plug from the core of that plaque using like a one male pipette tip. Everybody knows what a pipette tip is. And resuspend that into 20, 200 microliters. That's, that's like 0.2 ml, small amount of phage diluent or SM uh, buffer. SM buffer, very popular uh, uh, phage diluent. It's just a mixture of sodium chloride and magnesium sulfate and some gelatin in there to stabilize the uh, phage structure. As you, as you will see later on, the structure is quite fragile. So uh, gelatin can stabilize that. And then you carry out tenfold serial dilution of that plug using an appropriate buffer again, like SM. And then you add 100 microliter of this diluted phase suspension uh, to 100 or 400 microliter of exponentially growing bacterial suspension in an ependorf tube. Then you incubate that for 10 minutes. Uh, that's to allow the phage to attach to the bacteria. And then you add that mixture of the phage and bacteria to a soft agar, tempered uh, soft agar, and pour that onto a, a pre-labeled agar plate, a soft agar. So you have an overlay, essentially. You have an agar plate, and then you overlay that. And then you allow the agar to set, and you incubate that under the required conditions for the bacteria for 24 hours. And then you repeat this step again, uh, three times, this, this one to five step. That means you do this uh, three times to uh, really purify your uh, bacteriophage because you wanna make sure that it's one clone rather than a bunch of phages stuck together. So following the third passage, the final suspension of phages uh, that you get uh, is considered to maintain clonal phage. So you have a clone of a bacteriophage. Uh, so this one is an example of plaques that are generated in soft agar. So this is now the third passage. And you can see that this phage was plated at uh, 10 to the 7, minus 7 dilution, and you see small plaques. Here, it's plated at 10 to the minus 9 dilution. So this efficiency of plating of this phase is really high, and you could see that they make uh, bigger plaques. So, bacterial propagation on plate agar. So you have just purified the, the bacteriophage. Uh, so now you want to propagate it. So how do you propagate it? How do you make more of it? Because you, you wanna uh, use it for experiments or you wanna use it to treat 
uh, food and try and lyse bacteria, whatever your reason, uh, these are uh, two ways that you can do. Uh, one is plate agar. So you melt uh, the top layer agar and allow it to cool to 45, you set it aside. Then you mix 100 microliter of bacterial day culture. A day culture is about 10 to the 8 uh, colony forming units per mil uh, with 100 microliter of phage suspension. And you incubate those two to allow the phage, your phage that you're trying to propagate to uh, attach to the bacteria. And then you pour the phage and host mixture onto this top layer agar that you just melted and maintained at 45. 45 will not kill your bacteria, uh, but also will allow your agar to keep being from, from solidifying. And so you gently mix and pour it to the solidified agar plate itself, so as a top layer agar. And you gently rotate that to evenly distribute it. Then you leave the agar to set at room temperature for about 10 minutes. Then you incubate that uh, at whatever the bacteria likes overnight. And then uh, carefully you add 5 ml. So once you've incubated, that means the virus of the bacterial phage is grown and lies most of the bacteria. So you add now the uh, uh, SM buffer. Uh, to the plate and then you shake it around to try and you know get the uh, bacteriophages off and then you extract as much buffer phase mixture off the plate using a syringe and then you filter that to remove any bacteria remaining alive or debris into a sterile glass cap tube and store that at 4C. That is going to be your Back, uh, bacteriophage sample. For liquid media, you can also propagate in liquid media. So from a fresh overnight plate culture, you inoculate a flask, for example, with 100 uh, ml of triptic soy broth with a loophole of the host organism. Uh, you incubate in a water bath for about two hours until the OD, the optical density of your culture is about 0.1. Then you add one mil of your phage suspension. This should be around maybe uh, 10 to the 10 uh, plaque forming units per mil. That's for a low multiplicity of infection. Remember that uh, this culture here uh, of uh, PSB uh, is only 100 mil and you only grow it for a couple hours. So you probably have similar number of bacteria in there as your phages. And so that's a low multiplicity of infection. Multiplicity of infection is just how many bacterial phages per bacterial cell you're adding. So low would be one to 10 and high would be like 100 or 1000. If bacterial lysis has not occurred, you add one mil of chloroform to your flask, you mix it well, and then you extract the supernatant and centrifuge at 6,000 G to remove uh, debris and transfer that to another tube, centrifuge at the higher uh, rate for two hours. And then you, uh, that will be to pellet your, uh, your bacteriophage. Then you add your uh, SM buffer, to the pellet and uh, leave the phage overnight and gently shake it so that it get, gets resuspended. You don't want to triturate it or, or pipette it on and off because then uh, you might damage the bacteriophage. Then you filter it through a membrane filter and you tighter final concentration of the phage suspension. And of course, you label the tube, your initials, you wrap the tube in foil and protect the phage from UV exposure. So that's how you propagate bacteriophage in liquid media. And this is your uh, shaking water bath. So, but you know, not all phages are lytic. There are phages called bacteriophages that are called temperate. That means besides the uh, lytic cycle okay, that the phage goes through, 
which is what we've been describing all along, causing the uh, plaque to form in a bacterial lawn, it could just undergo lysogeny. Okay, what is lysogeny? Well, the phase DNA gets integrated into the bacterial genome. And as this illustration says, the bacteria lives happily ever after. Yeah, it doesn't lyse. So it just goes as it lives, goes on and on and on like that. And it's protected from uh, or immune from further infection. So as long as that phase DNA is integrated in its DNA, no other phase can go in. Okay, so the bacteria indeed lives happily ever after. But there's a way uh, to induce this phase to come out and lyse the bacteria. Uh, sometimes you may have to do this. Uh, there are instances where you're looking for a temperate phage, a phage, and the temperate phage is what you want. So what do you do? Uh, well, let's see. Well, to detect a temperate phase in a test sample. Uh, again, let me just go over the lytic cycle, right? The, the one where it didn't go on lysogeny. So basically, uh, you use exponential uh, cells to make your lawn, you spot your sample uh, and control strains, you, you, you make a lawn and then you, uh, you do your molten top agar and then you mix and uh, you're okay, you're gonna, you're gonna see your plaques. But if you are trying to detect a lysogenic phage, you have two options. One is mitomycin C treatment. So basically you transfer seven, seven mil of a day culture of your bacteria into three tubes. Then you add four and eight microgram per mil of mitomycin C in two of the tubes. The third tube is negative control, so you don't, uh, you don't uh, add mitomycin C. You record the absorbance value at the start. So what's the absorbance? So how much ba bacterial cells do I have? Then you incubate that in a water bath, approximate temperature, appropriate temperature. Okay, by the way, the bacteria here that you're using is supposed to have a lysogenic phase already, right? You don't add the phase later. You're trying to get it out, okay? So this is how you do it. So, and then uh, you, you basically uh, uh, incubate and then you record the absorbance of the bacterial suspension after incubation for two hours. And then uh, you transfer the treated, untreated bacterial suspensions to foil wrap sterile tubes incubate those overnight at appropriate temperature in a shaker water bath. Uh, and then you transfer one mil of the mitomycin C treated cell suspensions to an Eppendorf tube, centrifuge away the bacteria, and then you spot 10 microliters in triplicate into lawn plates uh, made from whatever bacterial you, you had it uh, to start with. And uh, so, you incubate the plates overnight and at appropriate temperature, and then you check for lytic activity because now, by now, your mitomycin C would have induced lysis. And if you, you see that, then you serially dilute the suspension and spot onto uh, host lung. Then you incubate overnight. For UV irradiation, uh, you can also use that to uh, induce a lysogenic phage. First, you dilute the exponential cells to uh, 1 to 100 in PBS and record the new absorbance using PBS as blank. And then you, the sample value must be between 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. Uh, you don't want the cell suspension to be too thick because then uh, UV will not be able to hit them. Uh, so you remove 20 mil of this suspension, transfer 5 mil petri dishes, and make sure the liquid coats the whole surface of your petri dish. Then you expose that to UVC irradiation. That's uh, short wavelength UV, very high energy. For the appropriate time required, 6, 12, or 30 millijoules per cubic centimeter. And they transfer that to a sterile cap tube 
covered with foil. And then you have also an unexposed plate of the test strains to make sure that uh, you, have, uh, you have a positive control that the UV treatment works. And then you transfer the treated, untreated, and then you incubate overnight. And then again, the same way as in the uh, mitomycin C treatment, uh, you try and find out if you have lytic activity induced. Okay. So that's the first part of our uh, presentation. Uh, second part is phase characterization. So we've learned how to isolate and uh, purify as well as propagate the bacteriophage. So now I have a bacteriophage, it's pure. What how can I characterize it? What do I need to do to characterize it? Okay, so phase characterization. So the uh, bacteriophage isolate that you have should be tightened by serial dilution to obtain efficiency in plating. How efficient does it plate? Meaning, um, the, the, can, you, can it cause plaques at 10 to the minus nine? rather than 10 to the minus five or minus six. That means it's really very efficient in, in, uh, in plating. So, so samples producing high efficiency of, plate, efficiency of plating values should be plaque purified and characterized. So we've done plaque purification. We just need to characterize it. How? So first thing is efficiency of plating. Then uh, we need to determine the routine test dilution uh, which is the highest dilution, which just fails to give confluent lysis. Okay, so uh, if you were to apply this dilution as a 10 microliter spot, you will not have a complete lysis. So some there will be some areas where bacteria is growing. Uh, that's what it means. Uh, then you, of course, uh, the lytic activity, which we will describe later on. I will describe each of these later on, what they actually mean in practice, like single step growth curve. So you have to determine uh, what is the growth curve of this bacteriophage. So if it infects the bacteria, how long it takes for it to multiply in there and to release itself and then to uh, attain a maximum titer. So you have your latent period and you have your burst size. Burst size meaning per bacterial cell, how many bacteriophages are produced. And then you have host range determination. Oh, okay, so you've isolated a bacteriophage against E. coli 0157. Does it also lyse other E. coli? Same thing with Salmonella. Does it lyse many serovars or just salmonella typhimorium or just salmonella enteritidis and so on. PFGE, this is just determining the size of the genome of your uh, bacteriophage. Electron microscopy, of course. Uh, you have to use an electron microscope because viruses are so small. They're much smaller than bacteria, which you can barely see in your microscope already. So that, this is how you're going to see whether it's a tailed phage. Of course, the genome can also tell you. If you sequence the genome, you, you can tell that it has features of like tail or, or a fiber. We'll talk about that later. So titering bacteria phage, this is just an example. Again, this is you're just preparing here the, uh, the uh, top layer agar and uh, uh, making sure that you have your bacterial lawn. Yeah, you gently allow the plate to evenly distribute your bacteria, and then you, you leave the agar to set. Uh, and the, the actual thing here is that you are preparing various dilutions of the bacteriophage. Yeah, so you dilute your bacteriophage suspension up to 10 to the minus 7, sometimes 10 to the minus 9, as I've shown you before. And then you spot 10 microliters of that, uh, two spots for each dilution into the lung. So for example, in this illustration, you have 10 to the, you start with 10 to the minus one here, minus two, minus three, minus four, and so on and so forth. And then uh, that's how you do titration. 
And of course, uh, at the end point, uh, like maybe 10 to the minus seven, you just see one or two plaques, the ones that I've shown before. Uh, but I'll show some more later on. Uh, so the, root, the routine test dilution is done this way. You add 100 to 400 microliters of bacterial day culture to the soft agar again, uh, yeah, but this one is tempered at 55 C instead of 45, but that's just a variation. You put it, put it into a square plate, then you leave the agar to set, and, uh, and then you carry out the tenfold serial dilution of the phase suspension up to 10 to the minus seven. Then you spot 10 microliters of each of these dilution to the lawn. Once they've dried, you incubate, and then you examine the macro plaques. So the highest dilution, which just fails to give confluent lysis, is defined as the routine test dilution. So every time you test, you use that dilution because that's that's uh, uh, kind of your near your limit of detection or 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 um, your endpoint dilution for uh, near the endpoint. Uh, for making plaques. Now, lytic activity of phage, you, you're gonna try and find out what kind of lysis does the phage uh, cause in your bacterial strains. If you're looking at different, for example, enterohemorrhagic E. coli strains, then you might have, for a certain bacterial phage, it might cause different kinds of reaction. Or if you're looking at Listeria phage, for example, uh, it might cause different uh, types of lytic activity in the different species of Listeria. So uh, they can range from clear confluent lysis, plus three, some opalescent lysis, that means that's not very clear, or very faint lysis, or no reaction, bacteria is not affected or you get individual plaques and or phase resistant mutants. So uh, what do these different types of lytic activity look like? I have a bit of an example. Oh, but before that, you just you spot the uh, species uh, specific phage uh, in your, of your suspension and then uh, you carry out in a duplicate once they're dried and they're, then you, you record the lytic activity of the phages on uh, the bac bacterial strains that you tested. You score it using uh, these guidelines here. Now, uh, for example, this one is an, a lawn of E. coli 0157, and we spotted different bacterial phages in here. So you see these, these bacterial phages cause them to clear out, really clear. So that's a plus three. Here, you see resistance right in the middle here. And here, you also have isolated colonies of resistant bacteria. Bacteria can become resistant to uh, bacteriophages. Uh, they have the, their own kind of like immune system, which we can discuss later on today if uh, there is time. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, so if you're working in bacteriophages, you can expect different kinds of lytic activity. Uh, that's the point here. Uh, this is part of characterizing in bacteriophage. Uh, okay, so this is the phage lytic cycle, uh, typical of. Uh, a uh, tailed phage. So you see how it injected its genome inside and made more of itself and lysed the bacteria. That's the lytic cycle. Okay. And uh, so this would be if you're imagining a mixture of the phage and of the bacteria, this would be the bacterial cells, and this would be the phages right here. You can see they're very small, actually. And if you're close to the phage, bacterial phage, then this is what they look like. 
well, at least if it's a tail phase uh, with, uh, with these tail fibers and a base plate. This is another view of uh, Salmonella with phages sitting right uh, on the surface. And this is an actual transmission electron micrograph of a T4 phage infecting the bacteria and about to burst it. So there's a lot of uh, phages inside already. Single step growth curve. So you have to characterize the growth of your bacterial phage in the host bacteria uh, using a single step growth curve. So here you are looking for a sigmoid growth curve uh, so that you can calculate the latent period called lambda here, which is calculated based on uh, the T is equal zero, which is the uh, maximum specific growth rate right in the middle of the sigmoid curve. Because what happens is your bacterial phage will start to grow, grow, and then at maximum rate when it's actually producing a lot of vi uh, bacterial phages, and then that levels off until it bursts. And this top part here uh, would be your burst size A. So for example, in a bacillus phage, the single step growth curve would be like this. Uh, the burst size is about 300 platform units and the latent period is about 84 right here. So uh, now for host strain study, for example, uh, we were studying a, a uh, listeria phages. Uh, and so you have your indicator hosts here, the various species of listeria, listeria innocua, listeria ivanovi, welshimeri, this is misspelled here, it's welshimeri, that's not I, that should be L. Listeria gray eye and listeria monocytogenes, of course. Uh, so you could see that depending on the species of listeria, you can have uh, various uh, efficiency of plating. Uh, and so this one, for example, is really good against Inocua and Westmary, and, and pretty good against listeria monocytogenes yeah. uh, because it can produce this much per mil. So uh, this one is better with Ivanovi. So sometimes if you want to cover all these species, you might have to use uh, several bacteriophages. Uh, you, may, you will have to use this if you want to cover gray eye, for example. Okay. And this one is an example of uh, host range for a bacteriophage. So here we have interhemorrhagic E. coli O145, O26, O45, and O21. And so it's lytic for all of these uh, interhemorrhagic E. coli. And here again is a screen for uh, the coverage of across the species uh, by different bacteriophages uh, within the Salmonella genus. So uh, these are all positioned so that you would know, okay, this one is not so good with Typhimurium, but it's great with Montevideo or Salmonella, Cirovar, and Tiritidis. So you do this kind of experiment uh, with your panel of phages that you have isolated. Okay, so what's pulse field gel electrophoresis? As I mentioned earlier, this is how you determine the size of your genome. Of course, this is how they traditionally did it, right? Uh, because uh, standard agarose gel electrophoresis, uh, it can only go uh, from 0.2 to 40, 50 kilobase, but pulse field gel electrophoresis, that extends it to 200 
base pair to 12 megabase. Of course, we're not going to get there. We don't really need this. This is for bacteria, but uh, it can also be used for bacteriophages, for the bigger bacteriophages that are bigger than uh, 40 kilobase. So they have been used, PFG, uh, to characterize the large viral genomes and to analyze the uh, integration of prophages, for example, and to study the replicative formation of concatenators and distinguish between circular and linear genomes because they move in different ways. So in viral metagenomics, they have used PFGE to analyze viral diversity in marine and hypersaline environments and in human fecal matter. So they would just run the whole thing and find out uh, you know, what sizes of genomes are present. PFGE, it's quite simple. You have a phage suspension, normally 10 to the 9 per mil. Uh, so you mix that with low melting agarose and pour, pour it into uh, molding blocks. Uh, so you have plugs, they call it plugs. And you release the DNA from the phage by shaking these blocks overnight at 55 degrees in lysis buffer. So you lyse the bacteria phage and then you wash the blocks in wash buffer for, uh, and then for restriction enzyme digestion, if you have to digest it. In the case of uh, bacteriophages, you don't have to, it's not that big. Uh, but in bacteria, you do uh, cut it with restriction enzymes to uh, smaller sizes. Then you place those blocks in uh, agarose gel. You seal it with low melting point agarose. And then you run your gel uh, at a certain uh, voltage. Uh, and the gel runs so that the big, the big DNA don't get caught, but get pushed down depending on the size. Uh, and of course, uh, charge. Uh, and then uh, you stain it with tedium bromide, and then you see the separated bands. In the case of the in the case of uh, bacterial phage, you just look for one band really uh, to find out the size. So you, you have a standard, of course, of sizes. So you run that alongside uh, your sample in this kind of uh, setup where your gel would be, and this would be just a power supply. So for example, uh, Colifad's RB5 uh, was purified by cesium chloride density gradient ultracentric ligation and prepared in agarose plugs, like I described, and run on PFGE. And then you, so you could see the size here is like close to 145 uh, kilobase. That's PFGE. Now transmission electron microscopy. Uh, so uh, when you do viruses in PEM, you use the negative staining method, it's called. So you put your uh, sample in uh, carbon coated 300 mesh copper grids. Uh, those are grids that they are like round grids and then it's a mesh made of copper and then coated with carbon so that you could uh, sit your sample on top. You stain that with uh, a chemical called phosphotungstic acid or urinal acetate, about 2% of that. And then you uh, basically view it in, under the microscope. So they have examined over 6,300 pages now uh, since uh, the electron microscope was developed. And 96% of what they've seen are tail phages, as we uh, mentioned before. Um, and then uh, the order Caudoviralis, uh, the Cyphoviridae order of phages uh, with long non-contractile tails predominate uh, about 57% of the tail phages. And then there are the polyhedral filamentous and pleomorphic phages. So you'll see all of this, well, mostly this tail phages uh, when you examine under the microscope. So, uh, this is an overview of the phage families. The tailed ones, of course, predominate, but there are these other 
uh, pleomorphic and filamentous phages. Notice that these are some of the more uh, familiar phages. If you have worked with uh, lambda or T7, they produce T7 RNA polymerase and T4 phages also. Uh, yeah. And uh, what are the morphological characteristics of tail phages? So tail phages have the head, of course, you want to know the head diameter and then your tail. So this tail here, you need to know the length, the tail tube and the sheath. There's a tube in the middle of this sheath. Then you have the base plate right here. And then you have uh, spikes or five uh, spikes here in the base plate and fibers also. Okay. Uh, so this is a negative uh, least stained transmission electron micro micrograph of a T4 phage. And uh, the illustration of that would be this. So you have the head and you have the tail inside. And then this is the sheath. And then this is the base plate. And then you have these uh, tail fibers. And another nice picture is there here. Okay. But again, these are just illustrations and uh, what you call all of these components here. Sometimes you have spikes, but then you have also fibers. And this is the DNA that's injected out. Again, there's another cryo EM. This is a cryo EM, so it's it's a realistic representation or illustration of what the phase actually looks like with the spiraling sheet uh, hiding the uh, the uh, uh, tube inside the tube where the DNA of the bacteriophage travels and gets injected in. Here that you see how the tube, how the sheath has contracted and the tubes coming out. These are different uh, T4 type bacteriophages. The first one is a coliphage. That means it infects uh, uh, coliforms. This one is an Acinetobacter Johnsoni phage. Acinetobacters are infamous nosocomial infections in hospitals. Uh, so they're the cause of them. Pseudomonas also uh, phage right here. So these two are very useful in phage therapy. And then here again is another uh, coliform phage. Uh, this is the phage lambda, very useful. A lot of people use the genome as a molecular size marker. And these are some variations. Uh, hopefully you see some of them. <laughs> they're quite unusual. Uh, and again, they are negatively stained for electron microscopy. Uh, here's another, there's a salmonella phage, epsilon 15. And this is just an illustration of, and the different uh, parts of the phage. These are all tailed phages. Uh, another one here, this is the T7 phage uh, of the T7 RNA polymerase strain. Uh, it's the negative uh, stain with PPA, phosphatastic acid. Okay, so genome sequencing, the last of the characterization. Um, and genome sequencing, we've heard a lot about it in, in the Philippines, for example. Uh, where we had to sequence the uh, coronavirus. So what is involved in genome sequencing? You have template preparation. You have, of course, you prepare the, the nucleic acid uh, that you want to sequence. So in this case, the genome of bacteriophage. You have sequencing and imaging, then data analysis. So that's the process. Uh, so it's not just sequencing. You have to prepare the template and then you have to image that and then analyze. The first generation sequencing is called Sanger. This is what they refer to as a dideoxy sequencing. Uh, but now we have the next generation sequencing, 
which most people are using. Uh, Illumina leads the pack. Uh, and then Nanopore, we have very unique technology here where you thread the nucleic acid through a hole. And each time a nucleic acid uh, residue passes, it's able to tell if it's uh, A or G or C or T. So it can actually sequence uh, the nucleic acid one strand at a time. But there are many holes. So it do that, it does that simultaneously. Rose has the four by four, Pacific Biosciences has its own. There is then once you've sequenced, you have to assemble these because you, you essentially sequence small fragments unlike, unless you're using uh, other technologies. But for Illumina, uh, you're really sequencing like 300, 400 uh, base pair size uh, DNA. So you have to assemble that using a software package, of course. And there should be coverage. That means you have found the same sequence nine times at least. So they overlap. And uh, that means uh, it's, not, it's not some kind of error in sequencing, but it's repeatedly being uh, sequenced. And then, uh, of course, you're able to know what the GC content is. Why did I skip that? And then you, once you know the, the sequence, then you can find the open reading frames, uh, uh, the sequences that seem to code for a protein. Uh, but this is all software-based, uh, looking for initiation codons and then the binding site for the ribosome for protein synthesis. And then, of course, once you have the whole sequence, you can look at the genome organization. Where are the structural proteins, the proteins used in assembly and the enzymes used by the virus or the bacteriophage for that matter. So we'll see all of that later on. Now the specific steps, as I said, you have, the, uh, you have to prepare your template. So you shear the DNA and there are molecular scissors, scissors cut, uh, to use, uh, cut the DNA into pieces. And then, uh, that's because you have a very long DNA for some of the phages. Then you, you do a DNA barcoding of these small fragments. That's just to help the sequencer uh, reassemble the, uh, the uh, sequence because you've already uh, cut it into pieces. So you're able to identify the shear DNA. And then you do the whole genome sequencing. Uh, so, it's all uh, by software, they all be, become combined into a, a genome. Uh, and then it identifies A, C, T, and G bases, as you know. Uh, this is bacterial, but uh, we're talking about bacteriophages. For analysis, scientists use uh, tools that compare the phage sequences and identify differences among them or they have a template phase if that phase has already been sequenced before. And you can look at wh what species by just by uh, the sequence. And uh, so here, uh, this is just a rehash of how the phase genome is sequenced. Uh, so you, you basically uh, break it up first and then you cut into fragments with enzymes as we said earlier, then you amplify uh, the different fragments by PCR right here. And then that library of amplified fragments is fed into the sequencer. Uh, in this case, it looks like a uh, MySeq from Illumina. And the sequence of nucleotides is determined and it's called a DNA read. So you have reads. And then the sequencer produces millions of DNA reads and then uses specialized programs that are used to assemble them into the correct order. And when completed, the genome sequence containing hundreds of thousands of nucleotides is ready for further analysis. And as we mentioned before, <clears throat> knowing the sequence, you can now tell, okay, this one codes for the head of the uh, bacteriophage. This one is for the lysis, enzyme uh, lysis. And then, uh, yeah, so you, you can get 
some idea of what the parts of the page are uh, or what components uh, on which uh, part of the genome are used to uh, for DNA synthesis, for uh, you know, tail synthesis, head synthesis, uh, to assemble the phage essentially. So these are some of the bacteriophages and uh, the sequences and how they mapped out which one codes for what in this in this bacteriophage. Okay, so that's uh, that's characterization. Now, as I mentioned, uh, bac a bacteria have an immune system apparently against uh, phages. And there are several of these uh, phages, I mean, uh, defense systems. Uh, that it's called a prokaryotic immune system. If you're working with bacteriophages, you have to be aware of this. Otherwise, you might lose your bacteriophage. Yeah, I've seen you say, oh, how come it doesn't lice anymore? So well, how come suddenly the bacteria is resistant? You have to expect that uh, because bacteria can develop uh, an immunity to uh, phages. And that's why sometimes you have to use multiple phages if you're going to target uh, a certain bacteria. So uh, what are these antiphage defense systems? Well, they're, I, they're called defense islands. Or restriction modification systems that target specific sequences of the invading phage. That means uh, that 75 of, uh, percent of bacteria have that, right? So uh, three out of four bacteria have a uh, restriction modification system. What does it mean? Well, they have a restriction enzyme essentially that looks for the specific sequence that are found in a phage. And if they digest the phage genome, then the phage cannot multiply. Of course, you've heard of CRISPR, right? CRISPR-Cas system. This is acquired immunity because what happens is once the bacteria uh, gets hold of the uh, phage sequences, it will memorize that. And later on, uh, once the same phage or a similar phage attacks, it will digest, it will cut up that genome. So 40% of bacteria. <laughs> and then there's the abortive infection system uh, that lead to cell death or metabolic arrest upon infection. Uh, so, but basically the bacterial cell commits uh, harakiri, just kills itself. And so the, the, the phage will not be able to replicate and it protects the other bacteria. And other systems uh, of unknown mechanism, 10% uh, of the bacteria have that. So uh, all of these are just being uh, elucidated. People never didn't really know before, just decades ago, that bacteria have an, an immune system against bacteriophage. They can defend themselves. So like antiphage mechanisms, as we said before, you have, uh, they have certain means to prevent the uh, bacteriophage from absorbing to it by maybe changing uh, the uh, binding site for the phage. Uh, and then uh, there are also some uh, defenses that uh, uh, are prophase encoded within here. So the phage cannot anymore um, infect. As I said earlier, uh, once the phage genome has uh, inserted itself into the bacterial genome, it cannot be uh, infected anymore. And there are other uh, adaptive immunity, as I said before, uh, where uh, the, uh, the um, bacteria remembers the phage that infected it before. Uh, 
So, yeah, so these are just more, uh, more ways by which now, uh, more ways by which the uh, bacteria is able to defend itself. And this one has is uh, an explanation of how CRISPR uh, remembers uh, the the bacteria phase that uh, that infected it because it will incorporate it into its own genome. So it copies this uh, fragment of the uh, bacteria phase genome, and then that goes in here, and then then it has cast genes that use this to identify. Uh, for example, if uh, if the uh, phage uh, infects it, uh, then it's going to cut up the phage. But phages also overcome uh, the uh, the CRISPR system of bacteria. So the bacteria develops immunity, then the phage change something. Like for example. Uh, modifies its genome so that it's no longer recognizable uh, or does a mutates one point mutation. So now it's things like that or deletes that sequence. So a lot of things uh, that the phages can also do to adapt. Uh, so they also have that ability. So it's really a, a race between the phage and the uh, and the uh, bacterial host. I think I will stop there and uh, take on some uh, of your questions. Let me see. Okay. Thank you for that very comprehensive lecture, Dr. Nadala. I hope our participants will be able to apply what they learned today in their own studies or practice. I definitely will. So now, let us now proceed to our question and answer session. Uh, the participants can still key in their questions on the respective chat box or comment sections from whichever platform they are listening in from today. Uh, the moderators will pick them up and be answered by Dr. Mm -hmm. Okay. No questions? Let's look into <laughs> the questions. <laughs> I guess they understood everything or <laughs> fell asleep. I don't know. For a while, sir, we're looking into the different platforms for the questions. Or they can maybe email their question later on. Ah, yes, we can also. There, we have one from Zoom. For a while, it got lost on us. From Tino Icaplo, what is the best age of the growth curve to harvest the phages? Well, I would say uh, once the uh, bacteriophage has lysed the hosts, then it has reached the uh, maximum number of uh, phages that are released. So, uh, yeah, I would uh, study that with the growth curve. And then you would know how long it takes for a single cycle of uh, replication for the bacteriophage. So yeah, uh, it's going to be not not at the uh, 
inflection point of the sigmoid curve I showed earlier, but at the uh, plateau towards the top. Okay. From Saira, Saira Bepindatu. Do phages also attack other types of cells or solely viruses only? I think bacteria only. She meant bacteria only. Do phages yeah. also attack? Yeah. The, the yeah. Bacteriophages, by definition, attack. Uh, Bacteria, you know, uh, archaeobacteria or uh, EU bacteria. Uh, but there are viruses that, of course, uh, replicate in other organisms, even mm -hmm. amoeba has viruses. Mm -hmm. um, from Gloria Quinones. Uh, good morning. I missed the part. When do you determine the titer? Can you further elaborate? <laughs> the when do you determine the titer? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, you, you determine the titer after you have isolated your page. Uh, also, after you uh, propagate it. Uh, so... That's the stage where you have um, passed it three times. So initially you screen, right? So from your sample, let's say sewage sample, uh, and uh, you put it in uh, that 10 microliter uh, sample. And if you get a plaque, then you pick that plaque and then you, you, uh, uh, you put it in another uh, lawn of bacteria, you pick again, and then you put another lawn, you pick again, and then you grow that one, the third cycle, now because you're assured that that's a clone. Uh, you grow that one either in broth or in plate, and once you harvest, as I described, uh, you can titer that. Uh, you would titer that at that point. And uh, if your titer is really high, then you have a good efficiency of plating. And then you continue on to determine the other parameters like single cycle growth. Uh, you might want to have it sequenced. Then you'll find out a lot. Mm -hmm. um, next question is from Henry James Simba, John Simba. Is it possible to gen genetically modify phages and use them, for example, in vaccines? Yes, it is possible. Of course, they've used different uh, viruses, not bacterial, but human viruses for making vaccines. Uh, but it's possible, of course. Uh, you, can, you can get the phage to display on its surface whatever antigen you like by modifying it, yeah, genetically modify it. Okay. Um, a follow-up question from Mom Gloria. Is it possible that a single type of phage will attack two or more bacteria? Uh, a single type, yes. There are phages with uh, wider coverage. Uh, it's a matter of can it bind to the to the bacterial host? So they have their own receptors in the host. Uh, and from my experience, for example, uh, you will find listeria phages that can uh, infect several listeria species, and uh, Salmonella serovirus that can infect many different serovirus, like a hundred or more. But normally, it's limited to the same genus. Yeah. Um, same thing. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, is it good, uh, from Lionel Lumogdam? Uh, good day, po, sir. Can you describe to us briefly what, with regards to your COVID-19 test kit that you developed? <laughs> 
Does SARS-CoV attack specific strains of bacteria in the body? No, no. SARS-CoV, uh, SARS-CoV does not infect bacteria. It infects our cells, but not bacteria. Okay. Um, from Dari Keith Escucha, is there any tool available to identify if the gene is from bacterial origin or viral origin? Yes, yes. That's what that's what bioinformatics does uh, because uh, we have sequenced so many bacteria cells now or bacterial genomes that uh, we can actually exclude them. Uh, bacterial genes have their own characteristics uh, compared to, uh, for example, virus or bacteriophage. Yeah, and that's why what I described earlier as metagenomics is very, very possible because of the databases we have of uh, sequences of bacterial genome, mammalian, human. You can distinguish all of this, uh, including, you know, um, including fungal genomes, plants. So there are companies now here in the United States that claim that they will, uh, if you give them a sample of food, for example, of meat, they can sequence everything in there and tell you what's in there besides meat, like what kind of bacterial species or, or even bacteriophage might be in there. Uh, and that's because our databases now are able to uh, tell if you if you feed in a sequence, uh, the database can tell if it's human or animal or plant or bacterial or virus. Okay. Um, Sir Jason Ramos asks, are we now capable to shift to phage therapy, replacing the antibiotics for bacterial infections? We are not, but people are working on it. There, there are instances where people got infected with bacteria that cannot be treated with antibiotics, and they were given bacteriophages that were developed experimentally. Uh, uh, not not FDA approved, so <laughs> it's kind of emergency use authorization type setting. Uh, but they were desperate, and I think the scientist who developed the phage was the husband of the victim, so they were able to administer it and actually save the patient. But but these instances are uh, anecdotal, meaning they are isolated. They're not, it's not standard treatment yet, but people are working hard to make it uh, a standard uh, treatment, an alternative to uh, antibiotic treatment. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, the new virology institute in the, in the Philippines, there is a project there that's actually trying to uh, find bacteriophages that can be used uh, against antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, next, uh, from Chelsea Nicole Makapagan. Good day, Dr. Nadala. Can you give us more insights into phage therapy? How promising is it and what are its advantages and its disadvantages? Well, as, as I told you, Bacteriophages, uh, they, bacteria have some innate immunity to them also. So they're not as foolproof as, as in bacteria can um, more easily develop resistance than uh, to a bacteriophage than to let's say antibiotics. Uh, um, so, you have to be careful if you're going to use uh, bacteriophage therapy, you have to use different bacteriophages, multiple bacteriophages, uh, not just one, because uh, the bacteria can develop 
as I said, uh, immunity to, to the uh, bacteriophage. So that's one disadvantage because of the systems I just described to you on how bacteria is able to resist bacteriophage infection. But still, uh, there are a lot, there's benefit uh, to bacteriophages because bacteriophages never infect us. So we don't really, uh, you know, we don't really suffer or there aren't that much side effects uh, with bacteriophage treatment. Uh, and they're quite, um, uh, they're not really doing anything if you, if you take them. And so uh, one very big application for bacteriophage is in uh, oral, you know? So for example, uh, if you uh, got uh, sick because you uh, ingested some foodborne bacteria, like Vibrio or Salmonella, then if you take orally phages, uh, bacterial phages, then it might help you because it will lyse all of the bacteria that you just ate and then prevent you from getting sick or diarrhea. So those are some of the things that people are uh, looking into. But again, it's not an easy... Um, easy thing to do, to develop uh, therapeutic bacteriophages. And people have been working on it, uh, but I still have to see uh, great success. Just like, I think what happened was, as you know, early, this cent early in the 19th century, when, when the phages were discovered, people immediately used them because back then, before World War II, there was no antibiotics. And so they were using bacteriophages extensively. The Russians were trying to do it. And the thing is, once penicillin came out and all these other antibiotics, people forgot about bacteriophages. They didn't want to do that anymore because back antibiotics were very effective. But indeed, they are also useful. And now that a lot of antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria are coming out, people are starting to do uh, bacteriophage research again, phage therapy research. But we still have to see uh, what the fruits of that research is. Um, okay. Um, in related to that question, uh, Mam Gloria asked, do they give the phage orally through suspensions or solutions or in capsule form? It depends on the infection. Again, if it's uh, gastrointestinal, then yes, you take it as a capsule form, uh, but, or even, uh, you know, you have uh, even as, uh, you know, in liquid form, but uh, the really serious life-threatening infections have been systemic. Uh, so people I know have been injected with uh, bacteriophages as well to clear their blood, system with uh, the circulatory system from the uh, bacterial infection. And also, of course, you have some topical application where you have an infection in a wound, for example. That's what's used extensively before pre-World War II. Uh, you apply it there and then it gets rid of the bacteria, bacterial infection in your wound. I think that's the most practical approach for, for bacteriophages, uh, except that we have other medicines for wound healing. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, last question po from Jeffrey Romero. Can endolysins produced by bacteriophages be used in biocontrol processes? Uh, what was that? Can endolysins produced by bacteriophages be used in biocontrol processes? Uh, control of bacteria, you use it as what? As, uh, as like an antibiotic? I'm Mom not sure. Use. I'm not sure how that's going to go uh, because uh, endolysins, uh, 
but it it uh, operates uh, from inside of the uh, bacterial cell. So I don't know how it's going to go about from outside. Uh, so I don't know the uh, answer to your question. Uh, I can't. Okay. Um, sorry, sir, may nagtanong pa dash na to. Uh, I'm curious if phage may also affect or kill our body's microflora from Ed Lucille Ferranti? Uh, it depends on the bacteriophage. Uh, I'm sure there are bacteriophages in your body right now that's killing your microflora without you having taken any phage therapy. Uh, they are in constant balance in your, in your tummy. Uh, so uh, any phage therapy would be targeted against specific pathogenic bacteria. Uh, so they will only affect those bacteria. Uh, they're very quite specific, as I said. Uh, a lot of them infect only one species, but some of them infect several within a genus. So no, uh, unlike antibiotics that kills, for example, any gram-negative microflora you have in your, in your body, uh, once you take the antibiotic, bacteriophages are more specific, uh, very much more specific than antibiotics. So in terms of your normal microflora, they are more, they're better. They don't affect you, unlike antibiotics, that they can upset your uh, normal flora in your, in your, uh, in your gastrointestinal tract. Uh, Okay, that would be all for our question and answer session. And answered questions will be sent to Dr. Nadala so that they can still be addressed further. Thank you very much, Dr. Nadala, and to all our participants who actively engaged in our question and answer session. Um, thank you for listening. Thanks, um, to, we would like to present you or your certificate of appreciation. Yeah. Um, this certificate of appreciation is presented to Dr. Elpidio Cesar Binadala Jr., Balik Scientist, Diagnostics for the Real World USA, for sharing his exper expertise as research person for the webinar entitled Phage Isolation, Culture, and Characterization. As part of the establishment of the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines, the IP program of the Department of Science and Technology held online on November 15, 2021 via Zoom, given this 15th day of November 2021. Assigned, uh, Dr. Annabel B. Briones, Director of the USD IPDN. Um, and, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nadala. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. We encourage everyone to, to turn on their cameras and Participate in the group picture taking. Yes. There you go. Okay. First panel, one, two, three. Next panel, go. One, two, three. Okay, next panel. Next panel. Okay, next panel. Next panel. Next panel. Next panel. That would be all. Um, this concludes today's webinar today webinar, please be reminded that you must answer the evaluation form in order to receive a certificate of participation as well as the copy of Dr. Nadala's presentation. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Nadala, our, our distinguished guest, and of course, all our participants today. This has been Isa of the DOSD ITDI. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paul. Paso, paglilingkod na walang kapalit sa bayan ng aming hati. Tara na, kaibigan, huwag kang magpaiwan. Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulo. Ating abutin ang pangarap liwan sa pamamagawa. Mahirap man ay kakayanin Sa pinagsamang lakas at galing Tagumpay ay mararating Tara na kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa ay susulo At ikabutin ang pangarapiwan Sa pamamagitan na Sa pamamagitan na maghang Ang kaunlaran ay makakamtan Kung lahat magtutulungan Tara na, sama-sama Itaguyod ang siyensya Maayos na bukas para sa Pilipinas Pangarap kong magkaroon ng mabilis at murang transportasyon para sa lahat. Pangarap kong masagot ang malnutrition. Pangarap ko pong magkaroon ng effective communication means for emergency. Pangarap kong ma-maximize yung renewable energy source and to reduce the carbon dioxide emission. Pangarap ko pong maging scientist. Ang dao simula na Humanda sabay-sabay akyat Hawak kamay tayo'y ang ating lipat Lipat Ating nabutin ang pangarap liwan Sa pamamagitan ng aghag Ang kaunlaran ay makagamtan Kung lahat magtutulungan Sa pamamagitan ng maghap Ang kaunlaran ay makakamutan Ang lahat pagtulungan Tara na, sama-sama Itaguyod ang siyensya Maayos na bukas para sa Pilipinas Maayos na bukas para sa Pilipinas Ayos na bukas sa ating iparana sa bayang Pilipinas. Ating abutin ang pangarap iwan.
Tumitilaot na ang manok Hudyat na ng pagpasok Paglilingkod na walang kapalit Sa bayan ng aming hati Tara na, kaibigan Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa'y susulong 